We have two verses from Scripture today. The first one from 1 Timothy 6, verse 8. But if we have food and clothing, we will be content with that. The second one is from Ephesians 4, 28. He who has been stealing must steal no longer, but must work, doing something useful with his own hands, that he may have something to share with those in need. The word of the Lord. The passages may be short this morning, but they're no less powerful. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, you have given us your word. Send now your spirit into this place. Illumine our hearts and our minds to understand what you are saying. Help us to write it upon our hearts and to be faithful to it each and every day. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. We have been studying the seven deadly sins on our tree. And of course, this was a way that the medieval theologians would picture the seven deadly sins. And we're up to greed this week. And greed deserves to be on this list of seven major sins or seven major vices. Greed is universally condemned in scripture with passages like Luke 12. Watch out. Be on your guard against all kinds of greed. A man's life does not consist in the abundance of his possessions. Or Matthew 6. Do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal. You cannot serve both God and money. Scripture is full of passages like this that make it very obvious that greed is not good. The problem with greed, of course, is that besides sexual intimacy, money is the one issue that we are the most sensitive about. But money and greed are talked about more in scripture than almost any other topic. More than sex, more than homosexuality for sure, more than divorce, more than gossip, more than murder. Money is talked about more than any one of those issues. Jesus especially makes it clear that nothing can more easily cloud our visions of heaven or our understandings of grace than money. His words It is easier for a camel to pass through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to inherit the kingdom of God. Those words are strikingly hard to hear. A little bit of green makes people go crazy. And that goes for rich or poor. And so this morning, I recognize that we are sensitive about money. I recognize it's a sensitive subject. I recognize that some of us have much and some of us have little. But that shouldn't deter us from seeing what scripture has to say. Because scripture says some good things and some hard things about money. So let's start talking about greed. Greed is probably the one vice on this tree that I really don't have to define for you. We know what it is. The definition of greed is exactly how you would think about greed. It is an unhealthy attachment to physical wealth. It is a yearning for more and more money or materials that overshadows other needs or other things in your life. And what's funny about greed is that while we know what it is, we often misdiagnose it in life. We think something is greed when it really isn't. Now, I long ago learned that not everyone in this room is Dutch. Some of us are and some of us aren't, but we grew up probably was something called the Protestant work ethic. Do you know, does people know what that is? I'm getting shakes head and some yes, some no. The Protestant work ethic is based upon passages like we read this morning from Ephesians and 1 Timothy, or passages like 1 Thessalonians, where Paul says those who don't work don't eat. The Protestants, especially the pilgrims, 
and the Dutch, who first settled the United States, taught themselves that the part of being Christian, part of the Christian life was working hard. Part of the Christian life was working hard, being good at what you do, being good and wise with money. It's a work ethic that I know many people here inherited, and one that is still seen in Christian circles even today. Many of us are hard workers. Even in retirement, many of you are really hard workers. And you're proud of what you can do. You're proud of the skills you have. You're proud that you can work or earn. And in that, we do follow Scripture faithfully. And through our efforts, we have gained wealth to differing degrees. But somehow, that picture of a person who is hardworking gets confused with being greedy. And that isn't true, not necessarily true. Spending long hours working doesn't mean you are immediately greedy. Neither is greed about having a lot of wealth. King Solomon in Scripture, who is the richest man in Scripture, was not condemned for being wealthy. He was condemned because he offered sacrifices to false gods. Greed is not about having a lot of money. Greed is not about spending a lot of time working. Greed is not about being good at what you do. It's not about having a well-paying job and being financially rewarded. Greed is not being proud of your work or even promoting yourself. Okay, that's what greed is not. But what is greed? Because we know it's the love of money, so what does that look like practically? Well, greed is exactly the opposite of what Paul calls us to be. Our Ephesian passage says this, He who has been stealing must steal no longer, but must work doing something useful with his hands. In 1 Timothy, if we have food and clothing, we will be content with that. When it comes to wealth, we are to be honest and we are to be content. We're to be honest and we are to be content. That's what Paul says. Greed cannot be honest, and greed cannot be content. Being honest about money. Let's admit it. It's not just Enron executives or big money Wall Street people that try to evade taxes or other things like that. If it benefits us, even for a little, we're willing to fudge the facts. I remember being a very little person and lying in order to get a dollar. It was just a dollar, but I was willing to lie to get it. Ask yourself, what have you lied about in order to get in the past? And maybe it's not money. Maybe it's something else. Maybe it's vacation time. Maybe it's help or something from a friend that you really wanted. How many times have you fudged the facts in order to get something you want? How many times have you been not completely honest in order to benefit from something? The Bible says be honest, and be honest especially about wealth. Because when you lie, when you lie, you're saying it's more important that I have something than you have something. And I'm willing to manipulate you in order to get what I want. That's greed. That is totally greed. Many of us are probably pretty honest, or I hope we're pretty honest about money. And I know there are times where we will not be. We have moments of dishonesty, and it just goes to show that greed is part of us. Greed always hurts someone. I was thinking this week about fraud, because of course it's tax season and tax fraud is so rampant this year. And I was thinking about people who do tax fraud and that lie they tell themselves, right? I'm not hurting anyone. All I'm doing is stealing from the government. I'm not really hurting someone. But the reality is, for greed, there's always a victim. Sometimes it is someone else, but greed always hurts you. It always hurts you. Is it ever really healthy to manipulate someone else to get what you want? Never. It's never healthy. Honesty for wealth. Honesty in our material wealth is what Paul calls us to be. And then the other one, contentment. 
And maybe honesty would be easier if we were content. Contentment is a four-letter word in North America. If we were really content, Christmas probably wouldn't be as elaborate for many people as it is. How many of us have more than enough clothes, but don't bat an eye buying another pair of shoes or another sweater? I saw some, I wasn't actually asking for hands, but somehow hands came up. (laughs) And if it seems like I'm picking on the females, I'm not. All right, all the guys in here. (laughs) How many... (laughs) How many of us as guys buy tools that we really don't need, but they're convenient? (laughs) I see a lot of hands. (laughs) How many of us spend money on gadgets that we don't really need? How many of us have to have a brand new Samsung or iPhone when just a regular phone would be enough? That's actually that classic sign of greed, that love of novelties, that love of something that's newer, better than the older model. The newest, the latest, the best. Whether it's a brand new sweater or clothes you don't need to a brand new car, because you have to have this new model because it comes with heated cup holders. (laughs) Today's culture celebrates this. It celebrates it. You can take out gap insurance on your cell phone so that when the new model of an iPhone comes out, you can get it. You can replace your six-month-old six useless phone with a brand new iPhone and it doesn't cost you anything because you took out insurance on it. There is something sick and wrong about that. <laughs> really? Sometimes we can't consume things fast enough. And that need to consume, that need to own something new, something better. And it can be something simple or something elaborate. But that need to buy something that really isn't a need or to replace something that isn't really broken. That's greed. And it's found among the super rich. It's found among the middle class. And it's found among the poor. It's found among us, and it can be seen in little actions, and it can be devastating to people's lives and their very souls. Paul says, be content. And we like to say, I need more. And that is spiritually devastating. It really is. Why? When we talked about gluttony, for those of you who were here, I said that we tend to divide things in life into physical and spiritual. What's physical has nothing to do with spiritual. For the medieval theologians and monks who were talking and came up with the seven deadly sins, the seven capital vices, the seven major vices, whatever you want to call them, that separation of physical things and spiritual things was a false separation. It was false. Physical things like food and sex and wealth affect our spiritual lives. For gluttony, for food, how can you not thank God all week for food, come to worship on Sunday morning, and suddenly be this wonderful, thankful person? You can't. Greed is devastating for much the same reason. How can you not be content with what you have and then turn around and be thankful to God for salvation? If you always need more, if other gifts, if other possessions aren't enough, how then can the gift of salvation be enough? If you can't be content with material wealth, how can you be content with Jesus Christ? That is a hard question. And that is why greed is so spiritually devastating. And that's why Paul says, be content. And that doesn't mean don't strive, don't work, don't have wealth. Contentment means if you strive to make $10 and you only make five, you're thankful to God for the five. And you don't get angry that you didn't make 10. And I'm going to be honest, everything around us, everything in us says, I should love having more things. Don't be content. Replace your TV because this one's on sale and it's two inches bigger. But when you are content with what God gives you, when you're really content with what God gives you, you can actually be thankful for it. You can. 
Being content is being called into a life that really enjoys something instead of always looking for something new or something better. You can really enjoy what you own because you're content with it. You like it. You don't need to replace it. To me, that seems like a much better way to live. So much better. When you are content with material wealth and what you own and you're not always looking for something new, how much more then can you also be content with what God gives? And especially that God gives salvation. How many people picked up a newsletter this morning in the back? A few. I hope you do. In the pastor's corner, I talk about this sermon series, and I say that the, ser- the reason or purpose of this sermon series isn't to say no. And I know that may seem that way. We, we seem to be saying no to greed, no to lust, no to gluttony. But the real purpose of this sermon series is really to say yes. Say yes to the resurrected life that Christ calls us to. Say yes to shedding these practices and replacing them with something so much better. Contentment means really being able to enjoy what God has given us instead of always wanting more. Being content is also able to fully enjoy the salvation that God calls us into as well. And that seems like a much better way to live. And Paul calls us also to give up greed for another reason, a really wonderful reason. About, oh, I can't remember. This is where I wish Ashley was here because she'd tell me how long ago this was. I preached a sermon on pride three weeks ago, four weeks ago, three weeks ago. I said that in the face of pride, Christians have to be humble, and that is absolutely true. But I might have given the impression that the opposite of pride is humility. Or the opposite of an ego run amok is humility. And if I gave you that impression, I was wrong. And this is recorded, so you have this on tape. I can say it again. I was wrong. The opposite of pride and ego is not really humility. Uh, The opposite of pride is really love. It's love. Pride is about us. Love is about other people. Jesus is really the perfect example of this. Christ came to earth not in pride. He came to earth in humility, yes, but he did so out of love for us. The love he had for us was seen in his healing the sick and having compassion on the poor and needy. And in his love, we see him walk to the cross. He walked to the cross not in pride, but out of humility and love for you and I. The opposite of pride is really love. Pride leads to lust, but love leads to good relationships. Pride leads to greed and all the terrible things that come out of greed, but love calls us to use our wealth for others. Ephesians four twenty-eight: He who has been stealing must steal no longer, but must work, doing something useful with his own hands, that he may have something to share with those in need. If you are looking for a good, healthy practice, write this verse on every paycheck stub you ever get, that I may have something to share with those in need. Christ walked out of the, to the cross out of love for you and I. We're forgiven out of love. And as Christians, we're called to reflect God's love to others. And that includes how we use our wealth as well. That's what scripture really says. Be content. Praise God for his great gifts, for material wealth, for salvation. But when it comes to using your wealth, your use of wealth should reflect God's love for people. One of my professors in seminary said this, and that was actually the sentence on the screen when you walked in this morning. Are we using people to get money or are we using money to enhance our love of people? And that's a good question. And I think it's a great way to talk about greed. Wealth used in love is really called generosity, being generous. Generosity is as diverse as as people are. It looks so different in different situations. But we are called to be generous And we're called to be wise because generosity is not just about throwing money at something without restraint, 
But what is important is this. Generosity says we have wealth to use for food and clothing, but also to encourage others in love. And that is done in many, many different ways. But there's something wonderful about generosity, about using money to reflect God's love to others. And it's more than just buying gifts or at Christmas or family gifts, although it certainly can be generous too. Generosity is more than just giving money. Generosity is getting a call to help your elderly neighbor, running to the store and burying the receipt. Generosity is those blue bins we put out occasionally in the back and make calls for food pantries or for matrix and those bins being stuffed to the gills. That's generosity. Generosity is maybe writing a check anonymously to help someone pay a bill. I see generosity in the meals that people make for others and those in need. In acts of kindness where suddenly money doesn't mean anything, but it's the other person that means something. I see generosity in money that's given to this church, but also to many other places. In the charities I know you support all over Lafayette and all over the world. For the people you support in various ways. I see generosity in the people that go to shut-ins and bring a bag of salt and salt their walkway. How wonderful is that? Or fixing something simple. I see generosity in the ways that people are willing to drive someone someplace. When moments like those are more important to you than items you can own or the satisfaction you get from owning something, then you are living out the biblical model of wealth. Wealth is given for our needs. It's given for our, for our clothes, for our food. And we're called to be content with what God gives. But wealth is also supposed to you be used to show God's love for others. To help the poor and needy. To help uplift and encourage those in our own church community, our own neighbors, our own friends. How can we understand and reflect the love of God if we use material wealth only to serve ourselves? We can't. But remember, it was God who gave it to us in the first place. I hope we use wealth well. And I know there's a lot of things I didn't say this morning, and there's a lot of things I could say this morning, but I could preach for 10 hours and not cover everything about wealth. But I want to end with this blessing. And I'm going to say this blessing to you. May the Lord who blesses you with little or lots instill in your heart a generousness. And may he give us the wisdom to be generous well, now and always. Amen. Amen. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, wealth and material possessions and greed is a sensitive subject because sometimes we do it so well and, and a lot of times we don't. But Lord, help us to live out more fully what you call us to be as your children. Help us to use the money that you have provided, the wealth that we have, to serve others in love. Lord, help us to be content with what we own and thankful to you always. Lord, we ask this because we can't do this alone. It is only through the power of the Holy Spirit in our hearts that we could even attempt this. And we ask that you reside in us, live in us, and convict us each day to be thankful, joyful people. We ask this all in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. We'll continue our worship this morning with the choir singing a jubilant song.
we come into a time of confessing our sins. And this morning we have a chance to confess our greed, and the most appropriate passage to realize this is to read portions of Matthew 6. Do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy, and where thieves break in and steal. You cannot serve both God and money. Christ's words from Matthew 6 are hard, but remind us what is most important. It's not what we gain in this world, it is what we gain with our Lord and Savior. So let us go before him in silent prayer, seeing the ways we have served and failed to serve him. Heavenly Father, hear our prayers. In the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord, amen. Romans 9, 10, 9 says this, If you, if we, declare with our mouths Jesus is Lord and believe in our hearts that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. And let us be a congregation that does that wholeheartedly. Amen? Amen. In response to God's grace, let us take off what is old and put on what is new. In humility, we Do not look to your own interests, but each of you to the interests of others. Every other sin a person commits is outside the body, but the sexually immoral person sins against his own body. May we look to God and his riches. Keep your lives free from the love of money and be content with what you have. In our anger, we may not sin. Do not let the sin go down while you are still angry, and do not give the devil a foothold. May we never turn away from God, but always towards his truth. Even if we are jealous, let us not boast and be false to the truth. Do not let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouths, but only what is helpful for building up others according to their needs, that it may benefit those who listen. And may we above all serve the Lord with all our heart, mind, and soul. Amen. In response to this, let's stand and sing, Take, O Take Me As I Am, number 741, and lift up your heart. 